Hello, welcome back to my channel. Uh, my name's Lena, if you haven't been here before, welcome. Uh, I make videos about books and poetry and politics and things that piss me off. So here we are. Today is a video um, of books that don't piss me off. In fact, they please me uh, immensely. I, uh, I want to say, am I into translation? Is that, that's too far, I think. I have a long way to go as a reader of translated texts. Not only do I really enjoy them though, but I also have found like, another layer to them, especially in this, oh, I'm not gonna say the B word, but in this Brexit world, where I'm trying to really quantify like the important connections between us and other countries and like how intrinsically similar and also different we are um, and trying to quantify to other people how important that is and like trying to ground myself in a more international mindset. Because before I think I was like, it's an international world, don't you know? But how much should I really enact that? I don't know. So when I try and, I'm trying to turn to the rest of the country and be like, we should be international. I'm like, what does that even mean? Uh, and I think part of it means knowing what other people's experiences of the world as intersected with the countries uh, they live in. And as an arrogant English person, it's very useful to me that most people speak English. It's very functional. It means that I can travel easily. It means that I don't feel a pressure on myself to learn a second language. But it also means that we can get fucking lazy when it comes to reading what the rest of the world has written. Uh, and it becomes a little bit <sighs> problematic if we expect people to write um, literature in English first, because their best, everybody's best literature, I think, is written from their mother tongue. It's like, like, like literature is, is much more nuanced than just like a communication thing. So it's done best in somebody's first language. And if you can't read their first language, I think the next best thing you can do is at least read the translation. Another problem is that translators aren't often uh, heralded in the same way as the writers. And oftentimes the translator can have as much to do with a book being good as the original writer. I was talking to this Icelandic writer, Kristen, um, recently. Uh, I was doing a podcast in Iceland uh, for vintage books and we were talking about translation and she was talking about how she knows the um, translator of Dostoevsky in Icelandic and she can kind of sometimes hear her voice in the Dostoevsky and it's like this kind of filtering through there's lots of different choices you make with language uh, when you translate it it's not just like a this word for this word and it's worth acknowledging that you have to be an incredibly good writer slash translator to translate um, something that said I do I would love these books to be even more diverse than they already are and I think it's just better to have a variety of stuff. However, a lot of the books that have come across my path and perhaps that systematic of the British market in general have been European languages, not always by um, people of European origin, but translated from a European language. So I'm looking for more, please send me some recommendations, but I will be more mindful of that, I think, going into 2019. So these are some of the books that I have found that I have loved. So because of this first book, I'm now kind of into French rap. I don't, I don't, I make no excuses, I make no apologies. Uh, but a while ago, I met this guy called Gail Fay. Um, Gal Fay. <laughs> Gal Fay. He writes in French. Uh, he grew up in Burundi. This is a fictionalized account of a boy uh, in a similar situation to him. It starts with the story of quite a normal, silly, almost childhood, a childhood of disagreement and disobedience and silliness. And it really gives you like a sense of place. It's very specific in its descriptions uh, and it's really beautiful in the way that Burundi is depicted. And it, it tells, at the beginning, it kind of tells the story of privilege, really. They live in a very sheltered part of Burundi and they have relatively upper middle class circles of safety around them. But as neighboring Rwanda is hit by war and genocide, um, that slowly stops being something that's happening on TV and starts um, trickling into their lives quite devastatingly. And it's it's really interesting that Gail like plays with fiction in this, but speaks from such experience at the same time. And I think it's really, it's a really intelligent look at the nuances of war, not only just being in the location of war, but being in the culture of war and how nobody gets out innocent, the numbing that can come from it. And also just like this really in interesting intersection between the father and the mother in the book and uh, the white father's internalized racism towards um, the mother. That's how I read it anyway, even though they're married. War is a horrible and interesting 
um, leveler of class, I think, because not to give too much away, but it it spirals into an unrecognisable place. And it's also like a useful thing to talk about, I think, because we have like this ridiculous narrative of Africa being so one way and so stricken with poverty and actually um the at the beginning of the book gabriel the main character his his life is very similar to ours um and it's important to read and circulate stories like that um i think uh because it's truthful and i like that so this is a book i talked about a while ago um, and i made a little video about so i'll link that below but it's called all this has nothing to do with me by monica sambolo it's like the um much needed progressive female answer to the obsessive man narrative. Uh, it's about a woman who is a journalist and she hires this man because she fancies him. And then she completely obsesses over him to the point where it's kind of funny and also like intrinsically creepy. Um, but it, it has like moments at the beginning where you're like, <laughs> I've done that. I've thought about boys like that. I've like been so creepily obsessed uh, in a teenage kind of way. And then it goes into this other place, but it's, it's very clever. It's got loads of objects and ridiculous like floor plans of where her desk is in relation to his. And like these great insights about cynicism and romance. And it's really good. This is a serenade to the unloved, a swan song for those who fall in love alone. Oh fuck, I just talked about how important translators were and I didn't fucking mention the translator, did I? What a dick. Sarah Adizian um, translated this one. And the translator for this one isn't named. That can't be, come on. This one is translated by Georgia Collins. Nice one, Georgia. Interesting choices though. Here, the translator is named in the dust jacket, but not on the front. Here, the translator is not mentioned in the dust jacket or anywhere else, but is just mentioned here on the front page. So I think, I think it's interesting is all I'm saying. Uh, next, we have got A King in Hiding, How a Child Refugee Became a World Chess Champion. You have to forgive me because I read this one years and years ago, but I remember absolutely loving it. Um, it's basic basically, it explains kind of what's happening there. A, a child refugee is discovered um, to be really good at chess and uh, is taken in by these caring, compassionate adults in his life. It's a true story and it, he rises through the kind of chess championships in France and becomes this kind of beacon of excellence and starts a really healthy discussion uh, in France around um, how we dehumanize um, refugees and underestimate their intelligence. So this is kind of, it's kind of written, it's written in a kind of memoir state, but also has this kind of fairy tale element to it that's really nice. Uh, and I think it's a really good, both uplifting and truthful um, refugee narrative. So um, it's kind of written by Fahin, um, but it, he was helped by Sophie Le Catia and, and I don't know how to say this, Svav Svava Sheva Parmentia. I got that wrong. Um, so, but they were like people that helped him in the book as well. So it's interesting that their character's in it, I think. And that is translated from French by Barbara Mella. So yeah, in there, the translation, the translator is only mentioned in the inside bit here too. Although to be fair, no dust flaps because it's paperback. Anyway, um, next we have got, oh my God, this. So, I'm so excited about this. I found this because foils were championing it. Um, it was just everywhere in foils and didn't seem to be anywhere else. But every time I walked into a foils um, bookshop, it was just front and center. And I don't think I would have heard about it if it wasn't for one bookshop chain championing it. So fair play to them. This is Convenience Store Girl by Sayaka Murata. Um, it is translated by, oh, in the dust jacket, nice one guys. Uh, translated by Ginny Tapley Take Mori. Um, it's got some great blurbs from, say, like the author of Mr. Penumbra's 24 Hour Bookstore, from Ruth Ozeki, who wrote A Tale for the Time Being. And it's just um, the woman who wrote Stranger Weather in Tokyo. So it's like, it's got some really good reviews as well. And because it was so short and I thought the blurb was so intriguing, I picked it up. Um, it's one of my favorite books of the year, I think. So it follows this woman who is in her thirties called Keiko, uh, who has never had any other job apart from working in the convenience store in her hometown. And it's this thing that there's so many people that have moved in and out uh, as they've become students and then moved away. And she just never, did and she's quite happy. There are implications that um, she knows that she struggles mentally with things and it has found ways to work around it and be happy. In fact, she's the only person that does seem happy about her situation. Her colleagues, her boss, uh, her friends, her family are all very concerned for her. One that she hasn't found a husband and she hasn't found a career. The narrative 
sits very much in her head. Uh, you see things in an almost kind of like blinkered way. Um, and it's really subtle and clever. And you work out that she is obsessed with the minutiae of, of this convenience store and to serving and to loving the kind of cognitive craft to what she does and how unusual that is and it, it raises but doesn't answer the question like is she a cog in the capitalist machine or is she a woman who has chosen um a lifestyle that is both systematic menial uh, but meaningful for her and and is that okay um so she goes to some pretty extreme lengths to try out what other people recommend for her and I won't give away how it ends, but it is in so many ways a unpreachy, undecided feminist narrative about um, what our manifestos should be for happiness and how we achieve those and also how we protect the vulnerable people in our lives and how we create in-jokes around certain traditions in the world like babies and marriage and how there is just this kind of unspoken spoken club that you are part of once you have those experiences and how you can feel excluded from that because these groups have made their family and and love relationships so much part of everything they talk about so i thought it was very useful and interesting i enjoyed it a lot so that's translated from japanese oh my god so this so this is a german translation um an exclusive love and memoir by johanna Adeljan. Um, and they've got the translator on the front of the book. Hell yeah. Um, translated by Athena Bell. I now actually work at Vintage Books and I read this years before I started there. I read this when I was a bookseller and I just got obsessed with the cover and eventually one day I bought it. Uh, and kind of like when I was interviewing to work at Vintage, like everyone seems to be very excited because we published like Murakami and Margaret Atwood and people like that. And I was just like, oh my God, you published this book. This weird German translation that nobody's heard of. I care about it, I'm excited. And, and that's like one of the reasons I'm excited to work at Vintage. I don't know why I understood. So I don't think anybody explains what this book is about better than the blurb. This is a super blurb. Uh, so I'm just gonna read it out for you. Uh, On a Sunday morning in October, Istvan and Vera start their day as usual. They tidy their house, Vera makes a festive cake to put in the freezer and cuts fresh roses for a vase in the living room. That evening, after 50 years of marriage, they lie down in their beds and take their own lives. Having survived the tumult, tumult? I don't even say that word, of the 20th century Europe, and after raising a family together, they would not accept the words until death do us part. While sifting through the fragments of family history in an attempt to understand the glamorous and enigmatic couple, their granddaughter, Johanna Adeljan, um, imagines their final day. Amid the family stories and portraits by their friends, she dares to give a voice to their never mentioned experiences in the Holocaust and their escape from Hungary during the uprising of 1956. So it's a real story told through the lens of their granddaughter who can never really know what happened on their last day when her grandparents committed suicide together, but imagines it. So it's kind of fictional, but um, is intersected with her impression of them and their friend's impression of them. Uh, and it's it's, so interesting if you are interested in reading about Holocaust narratives and the larger implications of that. Um, there are, I remember like reading it either coming or either thinking this myself or it actually being in the book that um, being in something as horrific as the Holocaust can make you feel like somebody else gets to choose when you die. So apparently the reality for a lot of Holocaust survivors was that they did commit suicide, either, either at the end of their lives when they're, they're very elderly or, or before and trying to understand that in the context of like horrific pain and whether that is sad or if you can really understand why that would be um what you want to do I don't know it, it was really it made me think I just remember it because it made me think a lot and um I love the idea of like still giving a narrative to somebody that you love even though you don't have all the facts and daring to write about it anyway and not lying about it and presenting it as fiction. I don't know, I just, I think it was a really cool thing for her to do. And I really, 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 really recommend that book. Uh, Stefan Hansel, this is a really small pamphlet book, but I, I really wanted to recommend it. Uh, it's published by Quartet Books, uh, translated by Damien Searles. A Time for Outrage um, is about the manifesto of uh, an elderly man. Uh, he was born in G Germany in 1917. He was Jewish and he moved to France 
for a long time um, and fought in the French army during World War Two and was captured uh, and sent to a concentration camp. So this is kind of his like note to the younger generation about what can happen under those circumstances. It's really impassioned. It's really uh, brutally honest and wastes no time in insisting that we um, fight for the ideals that he did. So I don't know. It was really interesting. And especially I try and read books by elderly people because I just think that we don't do that enough. And we sometimes glorify the idea of the debut author who's like under 30 and I like get really excited about it. But actually, I think equally as important are the people who have written their first book in their 90s. Um, so that's that's how I feel about that. Another French translation is The Library of Unrequited Love. You can tell by how many post-it note thingies I have in the side of this book that I bloody love it. Um, it's again like a borderline insane crush story. We all see a pattern. Um, it's written by Sophie Divry and translated by Sean Sean Reynolds. It's a woman who watches everybody in the library, but is really looking for love herself. Um, and is and is seen as invisible and kind of like this functional character in other people's lives who they just ask her for books and she supplies them and that she she has a very functional role to everybody else but actually she's watching everybody go by and um uses stuff like the dewey decimal system to understand the world and um yeah i don't know it's super sad and super good and she is a outrageous angry spiky character um the, exactly the kind of characters i love to read about uh, and it's super short so can't go wrong can't go wrong I've talked about this one before. It's kind of ridiculous, but it's called Recipes for Sad Women by Hector Abad. This is a Spanish translation. Um, it's so of its own world. Like you kind of have to get sucked into the strangeness of it. Um, I, it really helped me when I was single and kind of struggling to make sense of things. And it has like these weird moments of like literary illusions that are like very strange and dark uh but it's, it's it's really i think it's quite funny and it has this kind of like overtone of mischief about it i don't know i just really i just think it's a really weird collection of writing it's not even really it doesn't really have characters it's more like thoughts and silly recipes that are like one drop of societal expectations i don't know you can find wisdom in there if you look but i take it with a pinch of salt as well um, the only night someone said it's got it's again like a lot of these books I think they're why my, why they're my favourites it's got this rhythm of uh, its original language to it so they've been translated in a way that you know what language they've come from and they haven't tried to anglicise things too much enough for you to understand but not to take away from the essence of the culture in the language um, uh, and I, I felt like there was this book that's got this weird rhythm to it that I feel is kind of Spanishy. I don't know. Um, the only night someone said is the sleepless one, the night you don't sleep a wink. We don't store up memories of the nights we sleep through. Love is like that too. The most unforgettable one is the one that never was. Experience your sadness, touch it, pull its petals off, soak it in tears, wrap it up in screams and silences, copy it into notebooks, jot it down on your body, write it in the pores of your skin. For only if you don't defend yourself, it will flee at times, somewhere else that is not the centre of your private pain. <sighs> so good. And then finally, two Icelandic books, because I have just been to Iceland and I was uh, reading up on it and I love it. So I'd, I'd like to mention some more Icelandic books I've read, but I just picked out two. There are definitely more Icelandic books I want to talk about in future. And I know that I talked last video one of my last videos about hotel silence uh, so i won't mention that too much apart from to say it's fucking brilliant um but the other icelandic book i hadn't mentioned was ragnar jonasson's uh, book the darkness it's a crime book and i bloody loved it that is huge for me uh, i'm scared of the dark i really like serial uh, but apart from that i'm like i avoid crime because i thought that i wasn't uh, but it turns out I okay to be fair I did stay up till two in the morning reading this because I was literally like what happens um but I loved it so much and I thought it had such a great balance of like stuff about the landscape and being situated in the place but also just really plot driven carrying you along with the story making you turn every page so it's really like skillfully done and it has a female detective protagonist who is retiring uh who has been ignored her whole life by the men in the police place <laughs> you can tell i'm not <laughs> you can tell it's my first crime book can't you in the police place she has been ignored um and 
basically they're trying to etch her out before her retirement and she refuses to stop coming into work so they're like okay basically you've got two weeks you can pick whatever closed crime um that you don't think was solved properly and open it up again see if you can solve it um you've got two weeks we don't really care what you pick we don't know if we're even going to look at the work you do uh but that's how you can keep yourself um occupied until then because we've already replaced you with some young man (laughs) and she's like fine so she goes back to this case that's always bothered her uh there was investigated by one of her very slovenly male colleagues um, about a refugee girl who um, was either jumped off a cliff or was pushed off a cliff and she has a very bad feeling about this and doesn't think there was any motive for her to jump and thinks that she has been murdered but nobody really cares so she goes out there and she goes full throttle on this final investigation uh, while also struggling with her own past and trying to keep filtering out her own life and the things that she's Um, struggling with because that's what she's used her career for her whole life and doesn't want to face it. So yeah, very feminist, very cool. An ending that will end you. Um, That's all I'll say. It will end you. uh, And if you don't like crime, pick this up and maybe we can all be crime readers. I don't know. What's happening to me? Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the translated video uh let me know in the comments if you have some translated books that you like that you can recommend to me because i would love to read more if you want to support this channel you can turn your ad blockers off you can share this video with a friend you can subscribe and if you want to you can join the gumption club which is a cool patreon group i have you can join for minimum of a dollar per thing which is how weak is the pound right now i'll tell you (laughs) dollars to pounds oh my god no why 78p uh a podcast or video you can support the work that i do and it means you can be part of a secret facebook group called the gumption club where we share resources and i live stream in there and we have lots of fun and i give away some books and it's a good time um so yeah if you want to find out more about that i'll leave the links in the description uh thank you so much for watching um keep reading keep reading experiences that aren't yours uh and i will see you in my next one frog snog out I placed the camera too far away and I can't frog fucking frog 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 snug out.